What was your uh, initial motivation, your initial reason for, because you volunteered, all reservists had to volunteer. Why did you volunteer to go to Afghanistan the first time? Well, um, it was the spring of 2005, and uh, I was just finishing up my, my degree at the University of Calgary, and uh, I was working on a political science degree. I didn't have a lot of really strong ideas about what I was going to do when I, when I, uh, when I graduated. Uh, I enjoyed the military aspect of things, so I was thinking that I might uh, make it a career. So at that, at that time, I had, I had grabbed all my paperwork, and I was ready to uh, apply to the regular army. Uh, and then, I think it was the end of April, um, Colonel Tom Manley, who was the CO at the time, um, he had the whole unit on the, on the parade square and he, and he said, um, you know, we need a bunch of guys for Task Force 106 for Afghanistan um, right now, basically. <laughs> so, um, uh, it, the, uh, the way he handled it was, he basically dismissed the unit, said, if you need to call anyone, have that discussion, um, you know, do that, but we need a decision tonight and you need to be in Edmonton on Sunday because workup training was starting on, on Monday. So um, I didn't have to call anybody. I didn't, I didn't have any, like there's really, it was, it was exactly what I was looking for at the, at the time that I was looking for it. And to me, it sounded more appealing than going to the regular force at the, at the time. So, uh, yeah, so uh, yeah, on Sunday we started, um, we started um, some workup training um, uh, in, in Edmonton. Uh, we, we did some different courses. Uh, I, was, I was assigned to a PSYOPs unit, so I went uh, down to the U.S. and, and took a, a PSYOPs course in, uh, at the Special Warfare Center in Fort Bragg. Uh, and then we came back uh, in August and joined 1PPCLI and we, and we started our workup training uh, from, from there and kind of through the rest of the summer and the, and the fall. What, uh, I mean, to me, I mean, I was there then, but I'm fascinated. I don't recall what the, what was the urgency? Why the urgency at the time? Or did, was it ever explained to you? So I think, I think what happened was that there was a, there was a, uh, a defense and security platoon task that had gone to 41 Brigade. And someone had decided that the LERs were going to man it exclusively. And it was a pretty big platoon. It was like in the nature of, of 40, 45 people. Um, about a week out, it became apparent that they were short, you know, you know, probably half, you know, that they had maybe 25 guys or something like that. Um, and that just, they had like that at a higher level, there were some ideas about, um, you know, how those positions were going to be allocated, but at a relatively late stage of the game, it was, it was determined that, that they needed more guys, um, or, or sorry, that they couldn't fill the platoon out of the Loyal Edmonton Regiment. Um, as for my specific position, uh, myself and, uh, and Lieutenant Jason Heller were brought on for those PSYOPs roles. I don't actually know how those positions fit into that. At the time, there were no PSYOPs people in, in, uh, in Western Canada, uh, only in, uh, only in, uh, in uh, SQFT in, in Quebec. Uh, so I think, you know, it just kind of got cut up in that and uh, but but we really had no visibility uh, on 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 Highlanders going on 106 pretty much until until that Wednesday night. So it was it was a bit of it was it was pretty fast, but you know <laughs> you know it didn't bother me at all at the time, and, and it worked out perfectly because I was I was you know writing my last exams for for the for the UFC. So you know it was exactly what I wanted at the time that I wanted it. So uh, talk a little bit about, just explain, what did you do for workup training? In, in particular, what did you do as a PSYOPs officer? Yeah, so, um, so, so first, because the PSYOPs capability was really embryonic at that, at that point in the Canadian Army, they sent me uh, onto a U.S. Army course, so I spent about six weeks in Fort Bragg, um, focusing on planning, product development, this kind of thing. Um, once we got back to 1 PPCLI, you know, the training is not really geared towards the specialists. Uh, so we did a lot of different kinds of things, like we were, we were the battle group duty officer and stuff like that. Um, and we did some influence activity work in the big exercises, um, you know, where we would do products and, you know, handbills and stuff like that. And when a combat team attack was going in, we'd follow it along with a, with a loudspeaker and stuff like that. But it was, it was really, 
it was really limited. Like the, the, uh, the exercise construct was more or less conventional. Uh, like there was no mission rehearsal exercise. Like our, our, our enemy force was mostly LDSH uh, and they had a full squadron of tanks. And at the, at the time, um, th at the time it was believed that, that the Canadian Army would be divesting its armored capability. So they sort of viewed this as the, as the, as the last hurrah for, for them. So, so we put in these combat team attacks and then, you know, there'd be a counterattack consisting of, you know, a squadron of tanks and, you know, <laughs> like it was just, it was just bizarre in some cases. <laughs> uh, and they, they tried to work in some aspects of, you know, like a counterinsurgency kind of a, kind of a thing, but I, I just don't think they were quite prepared for that at that point. I mean, the, yeah, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not really sure why, but for whatever reason, it was decided to kind of carry on with like the generic exercise that had been planned for that high readiness training cycle, uh, because really like the elements of it that, you know, were, you know, kind of counterinsurgency focused were, were very little. And, you know, like you might have like a couple people in a village kind of thing that you might talk to and, you know, they'd really have no idea like what kind of effect they were supposed to generate. So the information you collected from them or your attempts to influence them were really kind of irrelevant that it was just, um, you know, that guy speaking off the cuff, you know, trying to play a villager as best he can kind of, kind of thing. Not, not like the training that was done later, later on that was a lot more tailored, a lot more focused. So, yeah, so that's my question. So this Maple Guardian exercise at that time, at this time for this roto, did you have civilian role players, Afghans? Did you have like the Seacan villages? In uh, yeah, so there were some Seacan villages. Um, the exercise was pretty live fire focused. So, um, so sometimes what would happen is you do a live fire attack and the buildings would be plywood and things like that. And then afterwards, some civilian, well, actually not even civilians, it was, it was military op war guys would show up to play, to play villagers kind of, kind of thing after everyone had, had, you know, cleared their weapons and, you know, that kind of thing. What about, uh, because you're going over there to influence people, what did you have in the way of cultural training, language and things like that to prepare you? Uh, I think it was in the nature of, of a, like a, I think about a day of language training and then maybe a day of cultural training. It was the same stuff that everyone else in the battle group got. Uh, however, through the PSYOPs directorate, um, the very last thing I did before I deployed, like literally I did my embarkation leave, I came back and because I'd taken the American course, I taught on the one of the first tactical, tactical PSYOPs disseminator courses. And because of that, I was able to meet some of the people in the PSYOPs community um, just before I deployed. And they had a bit of a better setup um, in terms of um, like providing some cultural awareness, like, like we did some different exercises for that, for that course, although I was instructing on it, I still got to kind of see it. Um, and they had a, a family of, of, of Arabic speakers that would do all of the, that would do all of the village interactions. And it was all very planned where, you know, you know, you know, you know, there was a real scenario where, where, you know, they had their objectives and they had their, you know, lives they were trying to live and you had to, you know, influence them, this kind of thing. Now, of course, it, you know, it wasn't particularly Afghan specific. It was just a little more regionally specific. Um, although there were some people there who had done some other science work in Afghanistan. So, so, you know, I was able to get some information from, from them, but that was, that was pretty much the extent of it. Like it was, it was very, it was very limited at that, at that point. How comprehensive was the American course that you'd taken before that? Um, it was it was very good. Um, it was it was taken. Um, it was like it was intended for higher level planners. Um, so you know, kind of focused on like determining what your influence objectives are. You know, analyzing your target audience, deciding how you want to influence them. You know, designing products, things like that. Um, and we did a lot of different kinds of uh, exercises on that course as well. Um, but it was all, uh, it was all, um, like, because they wanted to get us to work in a, get us used to working in a foreign language environment, it was all Spanish. 
so so uh, obviously the U.S. Army has a lot of Spanish speakers, so so they um, they leverage that to you know force you to work through an interpreter and, and stuff like that. And and that training was quite good, um, but again, not not really tailored to uh, to our specific mission. After your training, you, you're the first roto, the Canadian roto that's going to go into Kandahar. What, what were your expectations before getting there in terms of what you thought you were going to encounter? Well. We got a lot of information, so um, we we were we were sort of relieving two organizations because at that time the PRT, the Provincial Reconstruction Team, was a subunit of the battle group. Um, so the Roto Zero Canadian Provincial Reconstruction Team was already there. So our so the direct person I was relieving was was a Canadian, but at the same time the maneuver element in the Kandahar AO. Was, a, was an American unit called Task Force Gun Devil. Um, and they sent people back to brief us. So, um, like, I think, I think one of their company commanders in their OPSO came, came back and, and we had, you know, some pretty detailed discussions about what was happening in theater. Um, uh, you know, they'd been there for a year. Um, so we were definitely conscious of the fact that there was a real, a real enemy, there's real fighting happening. And uh, you know, and they gave us, I think, overall some, you know, some some uh, some pretty good advice. Um, so I wasn't I wasn't surprised. Um, like I I still sort of had this idea that it was like kind of like a stability and support operation that we'd mostly be doing a lot of patrolling, and it and it seemed like they were doing a lot of that too, but um, that they were also coming under contact, getting hit by IEDs, things like that. But also that they were in many ways sort of trolling for contacts that they would they would patrol in such a way that they would appear vulnerable so that the enemy would attack them. So like they, are, they, would, they would like patrol in squad size instead of in platoon size, um, you know, so that they could get into a fight kind of thing. So yeah, like, you know, I definitely, like, I wasn't, I wouldn't say I was completely prepared for um, how, how unstable and how violent that area of operations was going to get in the next six months. But I definitely knew that it was, you know, a, a real theater of, you know, a theater of war, you know. You know, that was definitely my, uh, my expectation. So let's talk a bit about or <clears throat> the reality when you get there. Like your, your first impressions w when you get to Kandahar. Okay, um, so uh, I get there. Um, you know, I'm sure a lot of people have told you about those, those silly big ass tents in Kandahar that, that uh, you know, that they stuff 300 people into and you sort of, you know, get this impression when you land on Kandahar airfield that it's just this like extremely disorganized mass of people that are just, you know, trying to, you know, get from A to B and get things done. Um, and you're just kind of a, a very small cog in that, in that, in that wheel, but, 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 but uh, pretty quickly. Um, I went out to the PRT compound, which is where I spent, spent the bulk of that, of that tour. Um, and that definitely felt much more, much more f f familiar, more, more Canadian, you know, you know, a Canadian kitchen with Canadian cooks and, you know, like when they set up the camp, there's actually like real efforts made to make people comfortable. You know, we, we were all, we were all living in a, in a warehouse. Um, and with some, you know, little plywood dividers, so you know you could share a room with a couple other people, but have a bit of privacy, stuff like that. So that that seemed very, um, you know, comfortable and quite familiar. Um, and then we um, started our our handover process, and um, a lot of a lot of the people that we spoke to, um, and I was somewhat privileged to, you know, being able to speak to the kind of people that you wouldn't. Normal, like that, like a regular soldier wouldn't wouldn't have a chance to because I was working in the, in the provincial reconstruction team. Um, you know um, what? Like um, during one of our handover briefs, uh, there was a um, a British um, like um, a DFID, so like the equivalent of the Canadian International Development Agency, and 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 one of the things that that he said to me was well, not to me, like to a group of maybe five or six of us. Um, you know, he said to me that you have to watch the Afghan National Police because they will kidnap kids out of out of cars just randomly, and that this is a problem. And you know, so that that was sort of my oh, these are the people that we're working with kind of thing. <laughs> um, 
And the other thing um, was one of our, our interpreters, um, and I, 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 um, his name was Junior, and I'll talk, and I'll talk about him in a little bit. Um, one of the things that he said to me was that if you want to help Afghan people, help them directly. Like, don't go through the government. And, you know, that, <laughs> you know, so those were kind of my first impressions that, you know, that, you know, like, you know, you know we sort of had this idea that we were going to be, um, you know, kind of working through the government on, you know, you know, ha you know, helping them, you know, maintain authority in the in the area, reinforce their authority, especially from a security standpoint in terms of the A and A and the and the and the police. Um, so right off the bat, we were, I was sort of hit with these, you know, kind of you know realities that it wasn't as, you know, it wasn't as rosy as as uh, as maybe I thought it. It, uh, it might have been, or at least like, you know, that, that people's interests were not as, as in a straight line as I would have expected, that, you know, that we could just work with the Afghan government, you know, and that the Taliban was our enemy. Um, but really it was more, you know, they were just another party that, you know, we, you know, we had interests, they had interests, and the Taliban had, had interests. And so it took me a little while to, you know, to figure that out. Do you want to talk about this interpreter junior now? Uh, I, yeah, I can. Um, so, um, so Junior, um, he, uh, he was the son of the Ministry of Interior representative to the PRT. And pretty, pretty early on in our, in our tour, um, him and his whole family moved into the PRT compound because of security reasons. Um, that sort of family was the kind of the closest, like on both of my deployments in Afghanistan, that was the closest family I ever saw to like, like true believers. Um, Cause I ran into a lot of people that were, that were not, but these people really wanted the Afghan government to work. They really wanted things to work. And they were obviously, even from the very beginning, they were at considerable risk because of this. Um, so, so, you know, you know, he was one of our main interpreters, one of our, one of our best guys. So when we go out and do, our, our PSYOPs patrols or even just going out with the CIMIC guys if they're, you know, going to do an assessment for a project or something like that. He was one of the main guys that would come with us and, and this kind of thing. Um, so he, um, uh, he also had a very good relationship with B Company. So B Company to PPCLI was tasked to provide the force protection for the PRT. So whenever we, we needed to go somewhere, they'd provide a patrol to get us there. Um, and in, uh, in April of, of 2006, in the same operation where, 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 where Nicola Goddard got, got killed, um, um, he, was in a, he was in a G wagon that got, that got, hit, by a, that got hit by an IED. And um, um, like I wasn't personally involved in any of that. I was at the PRT compound. But um, like Master Corporal Paul Franklin, um, Part of the reason why he got his his decoration was was because was because he pulled Junior out of the out of that G wagon as it as it burned up. Um, so he ended up he ended up losing uh, both of his both of his legs, um, and uh, and and of course his father was physically in the in the compound, and I was I was in the I was in the in the I was in the command post. And uh, so I knew that there was an operation going on. I was just, I was just kind of basically tracking it. Um, and, and, and I knew that some things had happened. We were starting to collect information. But his father had heard about, um, um, he'd heard that maybe his son was there and maybe, maybe he'd been hurt. So, so he ran to the, to the command post and was banging on the door. And, uh, um, you know, and... And you know he wasn't allowed in there. Like there were no Afghans permitted in this in this in, in this command post. Um, but you know I still went out. I went and spoke to him and just sort of he was he was extremely um, you know he was extremely distressed and he, you know you know he wanted to know what was going on and you know like and, and you know and things had gone so so badly so quickly that that uh, you know like he he had an idea that. That something bad had happened, and probably some some other like AMP guy or something that was with them, you know, had called somebody he knew on a cell phone, and that's how that's probably how he found out. Um, 
but I was not in a position to tell him what had, what had happened to his son. But he obviously knew that I knew something. And, you know, so I was just trying to, you know, kind of stage manage this a little bit. And in the end, the CO ended up talking to him and explaining the situation. But it was just like, that was one of those moments that I really felt that, that uh, you know, this was very, you know, very real. And, and uh, yeah, so that was kind of one of my first really you know, kind of one of my first experiences that really kind of drove home that this was, uh, you, know, you, know, you know, pretty serious. Was it also fair to say, would it be one of your experiences where uh, maybe you were closer to some Afghan people than ever before? Like, how, how close did you get to the Afghan people? Uh, you, you know, I, I'd say, you know, there was kind of as close as I ever got to individual Afghans. On my second tour, I was more employed in a, in a staff role and, you know, we worked with certain interpreters at certain times and there's people I knew, but like, you know, you know, I hadn't really gotten personally invested, whereas I somewhat had when I was at the PRT. Um, yeah, so, you know, definitely also started to, you know, feel for their situation that, you know, you know, th you know, y you know Junior was considerably um, better off than, than most Afghans, you know, the, he, you know, he actually had a family who could take care of him. Um, but, but this was still a, you know, you know, it's never, it's never good to lose your legs, but to lose your legs in a third world country, um, you know, is a, is a, you know, is a whole other matter. It kind of, you know, changes your prospects and this kind of thing. So, so I definitely felt pretty bad about it at the, at the, at the time. So what, what happened to him? Do you know? Uh, as far as as far as I know, he stayed involved in the in the in the in the PRT. Like after his convalescence, he started doing interpreting work, you know, in a in a sedentary way. Like, you know, he could he could do written stuff. Like his his English was very good, so it wasn't just, you know, he could, you know, he could write something if you know if you if you needed him to. So so I think for at least the time that that. That this, that you know, coalition forces were were there. I'm sure he continued to work for the, work for them in some respect, um, and and even just as I was leaving, he was I had I had heard that he was going back to work, like you know, so he had about a three or four month convalescence, something like that. So so uh, looking at your work what, as a psyops officer, what were you? What sort of tasks were you doing? Uh, so uh, in the in the provincial reconstruction team. Um, this, there was a one-man psyop show, so I sort of, I sort of did, did, did everything. And going forward, it was clear that it wasn't just going to be one, one person. Um, uh, so there was a tactical team in the battle group that, 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 that Jason Heller ran, and, and, they, and they accompanied all the battle group operations. And then uh, what I did uh, was I did basically psyops work principally in, in the city of, in the city of, of Kandahar, um, so examples include um, we uh, we um, had contracts with about six different radio stations to to broadcast uh, you know different kinds of messages. So I would go out and visit them and provide them with scripts and things like that. Um, we also did some product development, uh, so um, you know like materials to you know help people you know stay away from our convoys and 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 stuff like that. Um, we also did. Um, some kind of um, you know face-to-face -face work like so like we'd go out to the university and speak to the students there um, there were there were NATO newspapers and things like that and that was pretty much the only place in in the province where a NATO newspaper would be worth anything so you know you know so you know people that are educated enough to want something like that plus willing to read a NATO newspaper so so we'd go out there and you know speak to those folks um, yeah oh uh, we also um, we also supported um, the village medical uh, outreach. Um, at that time, we were still doing those. Uh, I thought they were. I thought they were great. Um, you know, so we'd provide you know loud you know loudspeaker support to help direct the crowd. Um, um, you know, hand out you know pamphlets on different kinds of things like you know tip lines, stuff like that. Later on, that became a lot more a lot more important when the joint district. T -t development centers were set up that you know every district had their own kind of local tip line and they wanted to you know they wanted to uh, you know you know encourage people to make use of it and emphasize the benefits of it that you know that if you report enemy activity that you know that it's going to make your community safer so you know you know to 
hopefully encourage people to you know take those kind of risks to do things like like report enemy activity to us, which you know I'm sure many people chose not to for lots of reasons. Is there is there one day uh, that stands out for you that's kind of particularly memorable for some reason? Um, so we did a um, a village medical outreach in um, um, in um, actually well there were there were two in a two day period that we did and I don't actually remember which town I was in that day it was either it was either Talican or or uh, or uh, or Nakane. both villages which are 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 notable because when I came back in two thousand eight those were not places that you could just casually drive to but but in but in but in two thousand six you you could I think it was in Nakane. So, um, so we did this village medical outreach there with, with, um, with, um, with B Company. Went, went, went really well, you know. Had a, had a, had a great, um, you know, rapport. I felt like, you know, I think about three hundred people were, you know, were treated like, uh, you know, that there had been some advance warning about it. So, you know, people had, you know, had been there prepared to, you know, you know, to, you know, receive some treatment. Um, and then, as we were as we were um, dispersing the the the, uh, the crowd, I I, uh, I fired up the, the loudspeaker and you know st you know started on the on the on the you don't have to go home, but you can stay here uh, kind of a kind of a message, and and the crowd started to grumble a little bit. And uh, B Company had an interpreter who um, who somehow well and. Again, things were pretty fast and loose at the time, so he he had gotten an AK somehow, and and uh, and but like the, like this 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 character was like a like like a very unusual Afghan. Like he was like six foot four, had an enormous beard, like just a like extremely intimidating character. So 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 he took he took one look at me and the other guys operating the the. Um, the the speaker, you know, kind of like you know, kind of rolled his eyes, you know, silly Canadians, and and he had his AK in one hand that he was dangling by the pistol grip, and he had a switch in the other hand. So he turned around at this crowd, and there were kids all like kind of at the front of the at, at the front of the crowd. So he started, you know, he started yelling and. People started to get nervous, and and he and he laid into a couple of kids with this with this switch, and then and then pointed his AK at the crowd, and a couple hundred people just just vanished, <laughs> and and that was the end of the of the village medical outreach. And 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 at the time, I was pretty disappointed that you know oh I think we've undone a lot of the goodwill that we just created, but at the same time, um, I also think that just sort of like culturally, um, you know that we, you know, we were not communicating in a in a sufficiently. Um, I'm trying to think of the of the word for it, but you know, like, you know, you know, you know, pleasant, but also recognizing that you know we have our own security that we're going to maintain, and we're not going to stay here indefinitely. Um, you know, so when it's time to go, it's time to go, um, and as it turned out. What that interpreter did achieved that desired effect, and the crowd dispersed. Um, you know, and and I'm sure later on we could have handled some, you know things like that better. But also we stopped doing village medical outreaches for 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 a number of reasons. And I, I personally thought they were really good, but the medical community doesn't doesn't like them. So that was um, um, you know that idea kind of kind of died on the vine a little bit. What what don't the, the medics like about doing them? Well, mostly mostly it has to do with the ability to provide comprehensive care. That the idea is is that they don't want to start providing someone care that they can't provide adequate follow up, or if they decide that you know that more serious intervention is needed, um, that they want to be able to escalate that. And there were always situations like around camps where that happened, where um, you know, you know, the local medics would 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 identify, you know, like a kid with a like a like a rare heart condition or something, and uh, 
and then they'd pull some strings to make arrangements for, you know, like, you know, there were different things that happened where people got surgeries and, you know, things like that. And, and of course, you can't do that for, you know, you know, for everyone. Like, our medical resources were limited to really providing care for Canadians. Um, so I think they didn't want to get pulled into those kinds of traps. But I, 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 I always personally thought that there was a lot you could fix with sutures, drugs, and, and some advice, like even like preventative medicine type, type advice. Um, but, you know, it was just a difference of, a, just a difference of, a, of opinion. And, I, you know, it was definitely more useful from an influence standpoint than it was from a medical standpoint. I, I wouldn't disagree with that. So you're in the business of communicating and communications psyops. How, looking back at it now, and on the sort of the whole tour, not just that one VMO, how, how effective do you think uh, your efforts and the, the, the battle group's efforts were in terms of communication? Uh, I, think, I think it was pretty limited. You know, we weren't, we weren't really doing like what I would call, you know, kind of classic counterinsurgency at that point. We weren't even like establishing ongoing relationships in, in individual communities, you know. You know, the, you know, sort of the PRT worked on like strategic level kind of signature projects in, you know, in the city dealing mostly with high level Afghan officials. Um, and, and the battle group was everywhere. You know, like we didn't really own any ground, so it wasn't like you really had the opportunity to communicate and develop relationships locally. Um, in terms of like the media side of it, um, there was, well, I, I, I mean, all the all the media was Afghan government run. So you know, if we asked them to broadcast something, they would they would do it. Um, you know, so in that sense, like we had some we had some good communications through those those means, but it was it was very um, like I'd say, like I call it limited or, or um, rudimentary is, I'd say, is a, is, a good way to, is a good way to describe it. And I'd say when I came back in 2008, it was a lot better. Um, and I don't know if we need to break that up in terms of how we discuss it, but... Um, say it now, yeah. Okay. Good difference. Yeah. Um, so so, so I, um, I returned... Um, uh, to Afghanistan in, in, in 2008 uh, as the battle group information operations officer. So, um, so an information operations officer is a, is a, is a, is a staff planning function um, in, a, like in a battle group in a, in, a, in a maneuver unit. And the idea is that it's, it's supposed to synchronize um, both the kinetic effects of that organization. So it's maneuver, fires, whether that's you know, killing some people or occupying a piece of ground with the influence actors. So psyops, CIMIC, public affairs, that, um, that kind of thing. Um, and I would say that by that point, um, th those concepts had, had gotten a lot better. So for example, on the, on the public affairs net, you know, we had a very good system in place where as soon as we got, you know, a piece of information about any incident that we would collect that, 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 that information and have a release that could be distributed in the local media um, very quickly um, that ensured that the, that the coalition version of events and the factual version of events was at least being communicated. Um, you know, the PSYOPs material um, got a lot better, like the tactical PSYOPs teams, um, you know, because now we were holding ground a little bit more, still not as much as I think we ought to have been, but there were a lot of combat outposts at that point that we were patrolling out of, uh, things like that. Um, you know, that they were really gaining an understanding of what was happening, you know, locally on the, on the ground and were actually working to, working to influence people and it was getting a lot better. Um, you know, we had, um, we had um, um, radio, radio Rana, uh, which was a, um, uh, it was a Canadian PSYOPs radio station uh, operated out of Kingston, Ontario, uh, that most Afghans thought was a local radio station. And, and for all purposes, it, it was. I mean, it was, it was staffed by, by Afghan Canadians. Their, their reporters were, were, were on the ground, um, but, the, but the, the on-air talent and the technical aspect was all, was all in Kingston. Um, and um, it, was, it was one of the most popular radio stations in, 
in the in the province in a place where there's not really a lot of television so it, it was you know what one of the major communications methods um, and in addition to you know playing you know you know you know a lot of the you know kind of music that was um, that you know the people were interested in listening to like it was it was it was a I thought a quite a nuanced influence operations tool that also ensured that we you know you know that 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 uh, we got our message out what um, how would you compare the maybe the the mood in those two the two battle groups that you were affiliated with between 06 and 08 in terms of just I don't know how gung ho they were how you know just their motivation that way yeah um, I think on both tours um, the the mindset like of our of our battle groups was very kinetic that um, you know that you, you know that they wanted to go out and 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 fight the enemy I would say that the difference between 2006 and 2008 was that there was a much better understanding of the operational environment that um, you know that we were much better at you know not offending Afghans and you know like in some ways like being being better neighbors to a certain extent like for example like in 2006 when I when I you know would do patrols in Kandahar city uh, we would drive at 100 kilometers an hour um, and based on this idea that if we drove fast enough we could avoid IEDs which was not correct at all um, and it led to a large number of escalation of force incidents uh, because when you're driving that fast people actually can't really get out of your way so so you know you know whether it's warning shots or shooting someone's engine block this kind of thing you know there was a lot of that um, by the time um, 2008 rolled around it was it was much better um, that uh, you know that there were official policies that you know in built up areas you could drive a maximum of 50 kilometers an hour you know in open areas you could drive 70 and you moved with traffic and as soon as that was the case and when I came back that was you know it was just how it was done um, escalations of force on the road with just regular Afghans trying to get from A to B was was actually pretty rare um, I mean there were still some incidents um, but it was it was a fraction of 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 what it was uh, in in 2006 so in that respect we got better at that part and you know like also like I'd say like on, on average soldiers were more willing to you know deal with Afghans in a in a, in a productive way um, but I wouldn't go so far as to say that we'd adopted like a a real counterinsurgency um, model that most of the time like our battle groups spent 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 their spent their days you know doing doing combat team attacks and I certainly wouldn't say that 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 was never needed there were definitely times where where that was necessary um, but there was also not you know what I would consider to be a, a very good you know kind of you know clear hold you know you know clear hold build was what we put in all of our op orders but we weren't actually really doing that so, um, like in 2008, for example, we took over from 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 Three Vendu. Um, they created about 20 different combat outposts in um, in Zari and Panjui. To do that, it took basically all of their forces just to occupy those things and you know resupply them. Like it, it basically meant that because they they built all these little combat outposts so they couldn't actually really do any patrolling um, you know that their footprint was was extremely limited and once we got there and um, the fighting season escalated again um, the uh, a lot of those outposts became unsustainable so for example all the all the combat outposts such as Talacan um, um, on the road um, which was um, well it was Roof Fosters became um, Hyena Road, I guess. Um, those those combat outposts. There were there were four of them uh, west of Fob Spiro, and Gar. Um, you could not get to those combat outposts in a vehicle. There was one road in, one road out, and it was continuously covered in IEDs. So there were only two ways to get there. One, you walked there cross country, 
uh, you know, in a dismounted patrol. Um, or once a month, a combat team would be formed to drive down the Argandab riverbed and then using armored engineer vehicles, crush a road to that outpost. And usually in the process of that, some IEDs would, would be placed and then crush a road out to get back out to the, to the, to the riverbed again and then leave. So, you know, it was a combat team operation once a month to resupply the, the outposts and, and, and like just to resupply. So, so it became apparent that that was not sustainable. Um, so they started to, started to close down some of these outposts and, and, and start to focus more on like areas that, areas that we could actually hold. But I wasn't convinced that the battle group was actually holding, holding anything, um, except for maybe a little bubble around um, um, uh, Fob Masumgar and Bazari Panjwi. Um, the, uh, probably about halfway through my second tour, um, we, had a, we had a plan that we were going to start um, establishing a permanent security presence around, around Fob, Bob Spirwingar. And the idea was that that was going to eventually connect up to kind of the bubble of security around, around Masumgar. So I, I went down to uh, Bob Spirwingar for, for about a week and I, and I, and I patrolled with, with, with B Company. Um, not that I was going to become like the point of contact down there, but, but just so that uh, like obviously like, like the platoon commanders and the company commander down there were, were you know, the the appropriate people for that, but just because I was doing some of the operational planning, that it'd be good if I if I knew the area. So so I went down there and and worked with them for um, for a week, um, and then you know wrote some reports and things like that, and uh, and so the kind of culmination of our tour was that we are going to you know permanently have enough forces operating out of Spurwingar that we could actually secure the you know, the dozen or so villages that surrounded it. In the, in the end, um, um, there was a lot of activity in, in, in Zari, and there weren't a lot of troops in Zari. So, so it was decided that, that instead it was, it was going to be necessary to do some additional, um, some additional deliberate operations to clear out Taliban-held areas in Zari. So the, so the rest of the summer was actually spent, spent doing that instead. Um, so I was a little disappointed that, that you, know, I, you know, I thought that we were going to, you know, have one bubble where we actually established some real security for the people in a, in a given area and, you know, and that that would, you know, hopefully, you know, could eventually kind of, you know, shield the, shield the city of Kandahar from, you know, uh, you know, from the enemy activity, you know, further, further out. Um, but, but... But, but in the end, it, it, didn't, it didn't work out just because of the uh, level of enemy activity. And it was, it, it was quite clear to us at that time that we were stretched far too thin. And, and there was, um, it, that summer of 2008 was just at the time that they were starting to, um, you know, bring additional forces into, into Kandahar. So there was a, an American unit that was just in the process of, of deploying as we were, um, as we were leaving. And my understanding is that, like, by, say, Task Force 309, there were, you know, three or four American battalion-sized units there, plus, plus the Canadians. Maybe to summarize some of what you've been saying, but how, how much respect was there within uh, the task force, do you think, for the kind of stuff you were doing, uh, the influence activity side of things, either in 06 and 08? Uh, I, I'd say it, it, it varied widely. Um, there were definitely some people that, that thought it was a waste of time. There were definitely people who thought that they could do better. And, you know, we always, we always thought, um, I think, like, especially by 2008, there was, you know, definitely recognition that the influence piece was very important. Um, but because we were a small capability, maybe a bit because we, we were mostly reservists, um, you know, and not, and not in command roles, didn't have, you know, resources in a lot of cases that, you know, sometimes we were kind of pushed off to the side and, you know, we had to deal with like little, 
little kind of institutional barriers. So like, for example, um, uh, for many years in Afghanistan, um, the American PSYOPs folks distributed um, hand crank radios so that um, so that people could listen to our radio messages. And it was also just like a goodwill thing too. Um, our, our like engineer squadron commander on, on 108 um, decided that, that the parts in those radios could be used as switches to make IEDs. And that might have been true. However, <laughs> um, I, I, still don't, I still don't think that the, you know, that the distribution of switches was the thing that was putting the IEDs in the ground. Um, you know, like, you know, you know, it was just sort of like a knee-jerk reaction to, to, uh, um, you know, to something that, that they didn't like. And it led to, you know, obsessive things about making sure that, you know, you know, that batteries didn't go out, um, you know, with the regular fob garbage because they thought that they could be used for, you know, for, you know, to build IEDs, stuff like that. Um, another one, um, uh, on uh, on one away, I did a I did a roadside um, campaign, and it was a it was basically to we wanted to leverage the fact that you know the reality that 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 that, that the IEDs killed a lot more civilians than they did um, than they did coalition soldiers. So we did a lot of product um, research, um, and. Uh, um, and came up with like a really good um, poster, like a like a you know kind of like a small bill, a small billboard um, that basically you know said something to the effect of you know you know the Taliban put a bomb here and and put your family at risk um, you know in in doing so um, you know so you should you know call your joint district you know joint joint district coordination center if you if you see something. Um, and we were putting these these signs up in places where where there had been a lot of IED strikes, but but again, um, you know, like and 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 in the in the end, the CEO approved the plan and, and they were set up. Uh, you know, some some people felt that those signs could be used as aiming markers on those same sites, which again was was also true. Although I also offered that, you know, if that was an issue, we could, you know, deal with sighting and stuff like that to avoid that. But I also thought it was a little, you know, you know, it, it wasn't reflective of like a holistic view of what we were trying to do, you know, and not really recognizing the fact that, you know, you cite your, you cite your IED and then find an aiming marker, not the, not the other way around, you know. <laughs> um, <laughs> And, and uh, but yeah, like, you know, so I spent a lot of time kind of, you know, managing those sort of, you know, you know knee-jerk reactions. And also, in general, I felt that the work we could do as, as influence operations folks was quite limited because of the operations that were actually being done, which were largely kinetic, where we could only do like very, you know, very small things. Um, so... On that, on that tour, I was the battle group information operations officer, but most of, I'd say maybe between half and two thirds of my time was actually spent on, on more like intelligence collection uh, role. So at that, at that time, there, was, um, there were no dedicated elements in the intelligence community to, um, to deal with what we called white situational awareness. So um, police, governance, um, you know, local leaders, this kind of thing. Like at the very high level, the PRT did some stuff, but it was, it was very much oriented towards like the high level provincial people. Um, but to actually, you know, you, know, you know, get to a point where we could talk about, you know, individuals and villages and stuff like that, and, you know, actually have that, you know, live somewhere other than, other than in, in people's heads. Um, so I did, I did some of that, like, and I prepared like, you know, uh, I had like a weekly kind of, you know, um, I produced a weekly report that what, you know, that sort of talked about what, what kind of factors were, you know, 
impacting on the population and you know what had kind of happened from you know from you know from their standpoint um and also um you know some profiles on districts villages things like that um which eventually became a significant proportion of the intelligence effort in, in afghanistan so just as i was just as i was leaving um the new all source intelligence cell was in the process of standing up a white essay cell because they decided that that knowing like the motivations of you know various local leaders was a lot more important than in some cases some of the enemy that we were tracking that was that were actually you know really kind of irrelevant people that you know um yeah, so it was just kind of a, a bit of a reorientation of the of the intelligence effort. What about uh, just one more question, and then I can we'll go back to uh, two thousand six. How much did you have to do with uh, civilian Canadian civilians, like from other government departments, who were you know meshed with the CIMIC in particular, and and what did you think of uh, more more in two thousand six than eight, um, although. I was part of a working group um, that that uh, dealt with kind of province-wide assessments. So basically, like every every month, like myself as a battle group rep, someone from the PRT, um, someone from the Omelet, and then an RCMP, CEDA, and and DFA rep would all get together, and we would, you know, assess assess the state of play from kind of a local perspective. So I dealt with them a bit in in that regard. Um, you know, um, I thought that the CETA folks had some great um, projects going on, especially the smaller ones. Um, the, uh, um, you know, like the, you know, like all the vaccination stuff they did through UNICEF. Um, I'm sure there's others that I can't think of right. Um, oh, 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 and uh, and uh, and microcredit. They had some, they had some microcredit programs that were specifically oriented towards Afghan women that that, that seemed quite good. Although the actual extent to which those pl programs actually, like those, those were great programs. I don't know if they were actually contributing to our, to our operational objectives, mostly because they were always done at, a, at, like the reason why those programs could operate was because they were arms reach from coalition forces. So they didn't have a Canadian signature on them. So I, I, don't, I don't know. Um, I, also, I also saw, you know, occasionally like, you know, the CEDA rep would say, you know, oh, I'd like, I'd like to, you know, you know, hear from you guys, like, you know, if you ever see this project kind of thing, you know, like the ones that are done purely on a hands-off basis through a, through a, through a, through a, through a, through a third party. And, you know, you know, the, you know, she would show up with a list of, you know, reams and reams of, of projects that have been bought and paid for. And, you know, when I saw those lists, many of those, you know, projects had occurred in places that we couldn't safely get to. Um, but also that I'm sure that a significant proportion of them were, were not real. <laughs> um, and then um, I worked with them a lot more in 2006 at the PRT. Um, I know in particular uh, DFATE because of the initial battle group concept of operations to work in, in northern Kandahar province in, in like in the uh, Shawali Kot districts they put a lot of money into focused districts, a lot of money into focused district development um, to work in those areas because they thought that the Canadian forces were going to be operating there in the long term, but it wasn't the case that we were going to be spending the next five, six years in Zari and Panjwi. Um, so, but they think differently and they think, you know, five, six year plans. So what they put into motion there, unfortunately, you know, probably wasn't, you know, wasn't necessarily the best use of resources. And it's not because they did anything wrong. It's, it's you, know, you know, kind of a misunderstanding that, you know, we were thinking tactically like a few months, we were going to do some operations in, 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 in northern Kandahar province. So they took that to mean that we were going to be up there for a while um, when, when really we weren't. So, you know, there was a lot of stuff like that. What, uh, what did you want to say in addition about 2006. Um, okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, so there are just a couple, a couple moments that, that sort of, that sort of stood out in my mind that I thought 
I mentioned. So um, uh, I went uh, I went on my on my leave I think in June, or maybe a little later than that, um, of two thousand six. So when I came back, um, things had changed quite a bit. Um, I even 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 before I left, I'd seen the writing on the wall that the that the provincial reconstruction team operations were really going to draw down um, because. Just before I left, we'd lost our mobile force protection because B Company got got tasked for for operations, so 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 we couldn't go anywhere. We you know people came to us, you know there were you know lots of Simic and Saib officers who had to do tower shifts, you know just like you know because there was just a, a handful of you know kind of random people left in the left in the PRT compound. Um, but when I came back, there had been a big change. So. So um, because those operations have been significantly drawn down for that summer, um, the, uh, um, a lot of the officers were, 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 uh, were, were, were reallocated. So the public affairs officer got sent back. A lot of the CIMIC people got sent to the battle group. Some were continued to be employed in CIMIC roles and some weren't. Um, for my part, um, uh, I got pulled back to the battle group headquarters. Uh, and I became the daytime battle group duty officer, and uh, I still had some side responsibilities in terms of like providing reach back support for the for uh, for the team. But my core job then then became the uh, the uh, daytime duty officer. Uh, and at this time, also the CEO of the PRT was was fired, uh, um, Colonel uh, Tom Doucet. Um So there was a huge change at the PRT, but also at the same time, their operations were drastically reduced, most of their officers redistributed elsewhere. Um, so then I spent my last two months of the, of the tour as a, as a duty officer. And this was quite different from what I've been doing before, but I had received some training on it um, because there were people who had been dedicated to, to, to that role. Um, I'd received some training on it in, in Canada, um, but some Folks were, were 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 reassigned. A few people were fired because it was one of the harder, like I mean, for a for a junior officer, it was one of the harder jobs. So a few uh, so a few folks were fired out of that job. Um, and uh, so I I actually found it quite quite rewarding, um, you know, to sort of like, you know, I wasn't necessarily happy with what was happening from an influence activities perspective, but at the same time. It was a little bit more like what I'd been trained to do as an infantry officer, um, and you know we were we were right in the middle of things. So it was you know getting moved there you know sort of had you know both you know both both good and bad and bad points. But I you know I got to be the you know the, you know the duty officer during some major battle group operations uh, at the end of the tour, and 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 I enjoyed that. Um, so then just a couple things that. I, I kind of wanted to mention about that time was um, one of the moments that will always stick out in my in my mind um, was uh, I was just doing my regular nightly briefing to the you know to the commander and and the staff and uh, um, at that time a big portion of the battle group was out in was out in Helmand Province and uh, um, basically um, helping out three para because they were they were in a they were, they were in a difficult position. And so we were in the process of forming some ad hoc convoys to do things like, 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 to do things like resupply artillery ammunition. So um, the OPSO at, at the time just kind of casually says, you know, you know hey Ryan, um, what, are the, what are the PSYOPs guys doing tomorrow? And of course, it's a, you know, it's a big room and you know, you know, the, the chain's there. And I just said, well, you know, it's, you know, administration, maintenance and all this. And I said, okay, well, you know, you know, we need those guys to go, um, you know, pr provide some security for, for this convoy. So, 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 so I went out to go find the team and, and I caught them just walking down the road and, and then I went to go see, and then I went to go see um, Jason Heller and he knew that the meeting I was coming out of, that there's probably something coming from that. So he sort of pretended to hide his face, and you know, you, you know, you, you know, that you know that 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 he didn't want to talk to me. Uh, 
about that and but you know obviously we still discussed it and, and I said okay well you know they need some extra guys to do you know to be dismounts for this for this convoy so you know obviously you know you know he didn't have an, you know any good reason not to not to send them um, but he also was very against the idea of it that he felt that it was not a a, a good use of of, of their time or, you know, like at that point, I, I actually, I actually didn't anticipate that they would have any more missions for the rest of that tour. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't agree with that. And I, I, I still didn't, or I still don't. Um, but, uh, you know, he was, you know, he was a little annoyed that, you know, that that task kind of came our way, um, which was significant, um, because, um, um, on the on the return trip, um, their their vehicle was was hit by a VBID. They were all driving in a in a bison. Um, so 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 in that um, in that in that in that uh, vehicle, um, um, a member of our team, uh, um, his name was uh, Corporal Jason Warren from the Black Watch. He was he was killed. Two other members of the of the team were were wounded. Um, also. The bison driver, um, who um, was a guy named Corporal Gomez, uh, he he wasn't part of the Psyops team. Uh, he was a he was a Reg Force uh, corporal from the first battalion. Um, he was um, he was killed. So you know we sort of had this, um, you know, like I've always thought about that. You know that you know if I'd made an excuse or you, you know. Um, you know, if it, you know, you know, kind of, you know, kind of worked out differently that, you know, that maybe those guys wouldn't have been where they were. Um, yeah, like I, I, you know, I, I think about that. I think about that a lot. So, um, and, and I don't, I don't question my, my decision at all. Like, you know, the army's full of tasks and, you know, that day, if my boss had said to me, Hey Ryan, I don't need you tomorrow. Why don't you go? I would have said sure, you know, like. Um, but the fact that neither Jason or I were there, um, because what they wanted were some troops to, you know, be security. They weren't looking for some, you know, for some officers. Um, we, 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 we weren't the ones who went. So, you know, you know, I'd say there's probably a little bit of guilt about that too. That we felt that we weren't where we should have been. Um, but uh, but I I still think that that the decision was correct. It wasn't like it was it wasn't like it was wrong for them to be there. You know, you know they were doing an important job. So when you talk to Jason about that, or after the fact, what 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 did you say to each other? Um, well, we certainly discussed that conversation we had beforehand. Um, but he's never he's never held it over me or anything like that. Um, uh, that. Um, you know, basically, like, you know, what he said to me is like, well, you know, you know, like, what if, you know, what if, you know, either, either of us had gone instead, like, what, what would that have been, you know, like, what, you know, like, what would that have meant, this kind of thing. Um, yeah, so, it, yeah, like, it didn't create any, any animosity or anything like that. Uh, and, you know, I still keep in touch with him, not as much as I should, but, you know, I, I do keep in touch with him. Anything, any, any other days from 06 that you want to talk about? Um, so the, the last operation that we did um, was, uh, was called Operation Bravo Corridor. And I think it's worth understanding it um, in reference to, to Operation Hadusa that happened uh, um, about a month later after, after we left. So, so it became apparent that um, you know, that the security situation, particularly in Zari, was, was deteriorating, that, that the enemy was occupying Pashmul um, as, a, as a way of, you know, challenging the, you, you know, the authority of the government in, in, the, in, the, uh, in the area. And there have been a number of operations in that, in that area that, that summer, um, but it was recognized that a major operation was going to be needed um, to clear out Pashmul. Um, and, and, and that the resources were not immediately available and would not be available during one PPCLI's tour. 
However, there were also a lot of ambushes uh, going on on Highway 1 um, north of Pashmool um, at that time, and it was felt that, 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 that something had to be done to, um, uh, to, uh, you know, to, um, to reduce that. So this operation called Bravo Corridor was, um, was set up, and, and it was basically um, a deliberate operation to clear a bunch of compounds on the south side of of, uh, of Highway 1, purely focused on these areas where we'd been receiving these, these ambushes. Um, but, so, so, so that was the operation that was planned. It was going to involve a B Company, a platoon of C Company, and, and a Reiki platoon. Um, in the, um, so that was the operation that was planned. Orders were issued. The day before, um, there was some activity that, that indicated a significant enemy presence in, in, in Pashmul, which was no surprise to anyone. But on the strength of that, on the strength of that intelligence, the CO decided to put an attack into, into Pashmul. So he took like half of that force, which was that platoon from Charlie Company and Recky platoon. And, you know, they went back through the city and then came back up from the south through, 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 through Pizari Panjui to push up towards Pashmul from the south. And that was the operation um, uh, where, where, where one officer Patrick Tower got his uh, start of military valor, start of military valor, um, um, one officer McDonald, same, same thing. Um, and like, I don't want to retell that story because I think that, you know, like I, I had a very peripheral role in it. I was the, I was the battle group duty officer. So, you know, I had a, I had a coordinating function from quite far away. Um, but I guess it's just kind of worth noting that like, it wasn't like the operation was planned that way. And like, it was just decided that this was going to be done. And, and, uh, um, and everyone knew that it was going to be a battle, like a major battle group, battle group operation to go in there, but just like kind of off the cuff, it was decided that two small platoons were going to do that by themselves. And, you know, the, the, you know, the end result, uh, you know, was that, um, you know, four, you know, four, you know, four people were killed, um, you know, and, 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 you know, of course, additionally, the operation wasn't successful. Like, like, although they got to the white school, only a handful of guys got there and you know and you know they had to be you know they had to be rescued by you know by Warren Tower and so like yeah I think you know I just think that that little detail never really stayed in the in the in the common um, um, understanding uh, so I just thought it was kind of worth worth uh, worth noting like like uh, you know there's a chapter in in uh, in Colonel Bernd Horn's book about Aunt Medusa, about Bravo Quarter, because it sets the stage for Aunt Medusa. And like, none of that is mentioned. So, <laughs> you know, um, oh, actually, sorry, now I'm really jumping around, but, but, but there's one other thing that I wanted to talk about, about like understanding, like the motivations of the, of the people and the level of Canadian understanding of that. So in the, in, in, in April, or no, yeah, April, April of 2006, um, a new police chief was, 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 was identified, uh, um, appointed for, for, for Panjwe district, which at that time was also administering Zari because Zari was a newly formed district at that time. Uh, this was uh, a guy named Abdul Razak, who was the, uh, Afghan border police chief in Spin Boldak, and he he was appointed um, um, as the as the police chief in in uh, in Panjwe. and within um, within a couple weeks of him being there, um, him or some of his people are are alleged to have to have conducted some some killings to uh, basically settle um, entrepreneurial scores because there's a lot of smuggling stuff in, in Spin Boldak. As soon as that happened, 
that, that was actually when the security situation deteriorated in, in Zari. And um, as a result of that alleged incident, um, that was when the Afghan national police in that area started to get really aggressively ambushed, which kind of got everyone clued into the fact that the security situation in Zari was deteriorating. Um, and that was that, that triggered that first operation into Zari where, where, where Nicola Goddard got, got killed. I don't think there are very many leaders kind of before, after, who, 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 who are actually aware of, who are actually aware of, of that dynamic. The fact that the thing that turned, the kind of, you know, lit the powder keg in Zari district was an Afghan police officer, you know, settling some personal scores. That, that officer was, was, was quickly returned to his original role in Spin Boldak. And, and, um, and, and when I came back, um, in 2008, he was doing that role. Um, if, if he's still alive, he might still be doing it. And I don't know if he's still alive or not. But, and I, I knew a little bit about it at the time, but I, I only kind of figured it out for myself fully um, a, year, a year later when, when, um, when Sarah Chase came to visit our battle group during workup training on, on 108. And she sort of mentioned a few of these things. And I, I, and I thought, oh yeah, you know, you know, uh, you know, there were some things that, you know, in those areas that, you know, that were reported as Taliban activity, but it seemed very strange. She's like, oh yeah, that's because that was so-and-so settling a score. So I eventually figured that out. And, and in, um, so, and I do think that some people did eventually, you know, kind of figure it out. But it's not like it ever shaped our government, like, you know, it's not like it ever shaped, like, the task force commander's policies, you know, or, or that there was ever really any recognition or, like, you know, how are we going to, you know, you know, how are we going to operate differently so that, you know, these kinds of things aren't completely, you know, you know, d d d you know d d disrupting our operations, right? Um, and I think at least for the first kind of three years of the, of the war, um, like certainly for the time that I was there, for the most part, people didn't know that kind of thing. And for the most part, I don't think people really wanted to know that kind of thing. And there are definitely individuals who are exceptions, commanders who are exceptions, but like on average, that's, that's kind of my, my guess was that, was that for the most part, people didn't really want to think about that stuff or, or, or deal with that stuff. Can I, we only have a few minutes left. Can oh, I sure. just ask you, I mean, when people, I think in sort of in Canada's history in Afghanistan, we look back on that Task Force 106, as like that was the summer of all the gunfights and, you know, and casualties as well, um, but maybe the most dramatic tour to have been on for Canadians. Looking back at it, what, what does it all mean to you having been part of that? And, 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 and what do you think of the way that it's been depicted, perhaps, that story has been told? Uh, so, well, I mean, firstly, I'm very proud to have been a part of it. Um, you know, um, I don't know if I'm going to get those kinds of opportunities again in my, in my, in my, in my, in my military career. You know, you know, we don't know what the future will bring. Um, so I was definitely very proud to have proud to have, to, have, to have been a part of it. Um, I think that perhaps we have a bit of rose-colored glasses with regards to the, um, you know, to our, to our involvement that we, that we haven't really accounted for like how, 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 how naive we were in, in, in some respects. Um, which, which is not to say that the people weren't putting their heart and souls into this, which is which is, you know, like, it's a, you know, it's a very hard thing to, you know, kind of question, you know, you know, you know, you know, some of the decisions that are being made. Um, but you, but like, and, and I do that sometimes, but I really don't want to question people's, people's motives. Like I, like I think that people were doing their best and, and uh, 
you know, like these are not easy decisions. Um, you, you know, so um, yeah, like I think there was a bit of kind of you know rose-colored glasses, and it's a little bit it's a little bit over 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 glamorized. Um, you know, you know, you know, you know, you know, similar to Aunt Medusa, you know, in, in a certain respect that. You know, really, the important stuff about Aunt Medusa was what was was what happened afterwards. You know, the ability of the coalition forces to to seize a piece of ground, you know, is really just a question of resources and time. That was that was never the question. It's you know what you do once you've once you've once you've done that. And what was it like after such a dramatic experience, but as a reservist coming home and getting on with your civilian life? Yeah, I, you know, I think, you know, I, I think my experience was quite different from some of like my, you know, colleagues a little older who, you know, had their, you know, had, had a Bosnia experience that, you know, there was a lot of public knowledge about, about what had happened and, and, you know, it was really kind of a high point for respect for, for, for the Canadian military. So although I was, you know, literally the day after I got home, I, you know, I was, I was, you know, completely out of the military environment, you know, on leave, doing my own thing. Um, you know, like, there are definitely people around who, you know, kind of have been, a, you, know, you know, had some ideas of what had happened, and there was, you know, like, like a lot of respect. And it, it, was, it, it was also kind of, you know, kind of, you know, kind of humbling, because, you know, like, the, the, there was a period there where, like, you know, like, you couldn't buy a meal in, in uniform you know, in the city of Calgary. And that was great. It was, it was, it was awesome. But you feel, you know, a little unworthy in some respects as well. Like it's, you know, you know, most of us were just kind of, you know, most of us didn't do anything particularly heroic or, you know, you know, we were just doing our, we were, we were just doing our jobs. The other thing is, is that I, like when I came off of 106, I, I, I felt like I hadn't really, like, I felt that there'd been some kind of unfinished business that I hadn't done what I personally needed to do in Afghanistan. So I, you know, immediately, you know, made it known to my chain of command that I wanted to go again. And as a result, I spent, you know, about three months in, in Calgary, you know, right after Christmas, a position was identified for me. And by March, I was in Shiloh with two PPCLI starting my workup training. So, um, in that respect, like I wanted to, you know, kind of get back into things right away. And then when I was, um, and then when I was done, um, yeah, you know, like, I guess I never really thought I was done. Like, like I, 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 I had a, um, I sort of had it in my mind that, you know, I might, you know, go back. Um, in the end that, in the end that, that didn't happen. Um, but, you know, at some point, like I, you know, I'm still interested in other deployments, other things. So I expect that that may come up again. And, you know, but I, so I guess I didn't realize that my involvement in Afghanistan had come to an end. So I never really thought of it that way. And I've, and I've, I've tried to stay abreast of, of what, you know, of what had happened, you know, you know, since, you know, like, you know, asking very specific questions to the people that were there later on. And, you know, now you can, you can, you know, go on to Google and you can see pictures of the abandoned PRT compound um, or, well, quasi abandoned. I think there's some Afghan government authority there, but, but it is now in a state of disrepair and you can see pictures of that on, you know, um, online. So, um, so yeah, I, I guess I never really thought of it as a conclusion. I just, I just, you know, you know, I sort of stayed involved to a, you know, in an in a indirect way. Any sort of just because of the time I have oh, to yeah, Joe at the door. But is there any final, any final thought from you? Anything you haven't said that you want that you think you want to get off, get, get off, say or get off your chest? Uh, no, I don't. I don't think so. I think I've covered the ground. Good. Thanks very much. Cool. Thanks.